The DSM-5 field trial uh, for hypersexual disorder that we're conducting at UCLA has certainly uh, sparked a lot of curiosity and interest, both on the part of academics and uh, the general public. Essentially, a field trial is an opportunity to take a proposed criteria that's tentative at this point for a test drive. And we take it for a test drive to determine whether or not it can be reliably diagnosed and whether or not there's actually validity to the criteria itself. Our particular research team consists of 10 individuals. Half of the team is men, half of the team are women. And there's a broad range of clinical experience amongst the people on the team. We have people that have practiced for just a few years to people that have practiced for over a decade. We have a broad range of disciplines in the context of training. We have psychiatrists, psychologists, we have marriage and family therapists, licensed clinical social workers. A broad range of uh, diverse beliefs amongst the people on our research team and demographically uh, we're located throughout the country. We have uh, research team members uh, located in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Colorado, Texas, Utah, and here in California. And essentially what we do is we meet with patients who are seeking help at outpatient uh, uh, facilities and we interview them to determine whether or not they would meet the criteria for hypersexual disorder as it's currently been proposed. Essentially, the way the study works is we uh, consent an individual, meaning we meet with them and talk to them about the criteria, the criteria for participating in the study, what the study entails. We want them to have a clear understanding of, of their participation and what it will involve. After patients have consented, we then administer to them a battery of psychological tests consisting of tests associated with mental health, tests of substance abuse histories, tests of uh, sexual history, and so forth. Uh, those tests together take about an hour and a half. Of course, there's confidentiality associated with their participation, and after they complete those tests, then they meet with a member of our research team who will then interview them. We interview them for mental health issues, and then we have another interview that we conduct where we're interviewing them uh, for the criteria for hypersexual disorder as it's, uh, as it's been proposed. So we're asking them questions about the degree to which they feel like their sexual fantasies, urges, and behaviors have been excessive or uh, the degree to which they feel like they've engaged in sexual fantasies, urges, and behaviors in response to uh, uncomfortable, awkward, or unpleasant feelings or stress-induced uh, types of activities. Uh, the degree to which they've uh, encountered multiple unsuccessful attempts to try to reduce or control or abandon sexual uh, behaviors that they believe have been problematic. We then will ask them about the degree to which they've engaged in behaviors uh, despite being aware of risk for physical harm or emotional harm to themselves or others. The degree to which they feel like the behaviors, the sexual fantasies, urges and behaviors have uh, caused them personal uh, distress in their lives or to the degree to which it's interfered or caused impairment with personal relationships or social interactions or work and so forth. And then we're curious about whether or not the behaviors are related to substance abuse or related to uh, manic episodes uh, associated with bipolar. And so what we do is we audio record these interviews and the only other person that has access to that is a number, another member of the research team that will blindly rate uh, the patient's responses and then we compare notes between the researchers to see if we agree or disagree on whether or not a given patient meets the criteria for a mental health disorder, whether or not they meet the criteria for hypersexual disorder, and that's one of the ways we kind of determine reliability. Two weeks following uh, that interview that takes about an hour, uh, we then uh, have them do about 10 minutes more of psychological tests and then they have a, a, an interview with one of the research members uh, for about 10 minutes and that's the extent of their participation. We give them feedback on their testing uh, to their primary mental health professionals uh, that they're working with in treatment and, uh, and that feedback has often been helpful and valuable for planning and treatment interventions working with these patients and we find that many of the patients have been so gracious in the gift of their time and their willingness to participate it's not uncommon to hear patients say hey you know this problem has really reaped a lot of havoc in my life and if I can give a few hours of my time in a way that will help and give back to, to serve others I'm more than happy to do that and we've been so gracious uh, uh, grateful for that gift and, and for their willingness to participate 
And uh, their stories are remarkable. These are just really good people making some unhealthy choices that are causing problems in their life. And they, many of them have a genuine desire to try to change their behavior, but have struggled to really uh, be able to do that. And subsequently, they've uh, admitted themselves into various treatment programs to try to find additional resources to modify their behavior patterns. Uh, what we uh, are finding to date is that there does appear to be some evidence that this uh, disorder, as it's currently been proposed, can be reliably diagnosed amongst clinicians, and that these patients uh, uh, report uh, various symptoms that are consistent with the criteria that's been proposed. As far as whether or not the, uh, the uh, disorder itself will appear in the, D the forthcoming DSM-5 in uh, the May of uh, 2013, which is when I believe it's scheduled to come out, that's up to the American Psychiatric Association. That's out of our hands. It's not our decision. And to what degree it, it will appear in there, whether it will be considered as an appendix item or whether it will be uh, left out of the DSM-5 uh, for a lack of scientific research to substantiate the, the disorder, that ultimately is a decision that the, the powers that be are going to have to make. We're certainly committed to a rigorous uh, field trial that will help us uh, answer the questions that we are seeking to find uh, answers to, and then we will report on that and publish on that in the peer-reviewed uh, scientific uh, literature, and uh, that will hopefully benefit other mental health professionals that are working with uh, various individuals seeking help for this. Again, we're so grateful for the many individuals that have come forth and said, uh, shared their stories with us. It takes a lot of courage on their part to do that. Despite the fact that we're offering confidentiality, we, we certainly appreciate that. And we've learned a lot about their stories and their struggles, and that's been very insightful for us as members of the research team as we continue to try to understand this. Uh, and so it's, it's been a real privilege, quite frankly, to, and an exciting one at that, to uh, understand uh, uh, for the first time ever, this uh, field trial has got a very tightly defined operationalized criteria for hypersexual disorder. We've got multiple clinicians that are uh, looking in on each case to determine whether or not an individual in fact meets that criteria and uh, having opportunities to discuss uh, the ramifications of that and, and what that means for a particular individual. And again, uh, such a wonderful opportunity to be part of this uh, research and uh, so grateful for the many individuals who shared their time and their stories uh, as we uh, continue to try to understand this phenomenon.